What's up you guys? Welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. I wanted to start off and take a moment to, from the bottom of my heart, thank you to everyone who reached out, who shared their stories, their personal journeys with me, who shared words of encouragement, who showed so much support. I, I am truly grateful. It's not easy being that vulnerable on the internet and that video was in my computer for about two to three weeks before I had the courage to actually upload it. So I really appreciate all the, the positivity and the love that has been sent. Thank you. So I was going to start talking about my testing and kind of the journey that I was have been going through with the results and, and, and whatnot. But I decided to actually go into the male factor fertility first because this is something where we more or less have a happy ending but we were able to find an actual solution to the male factor fertility so kind of wanted to share that and i feel like it's not talked about enough nobody really talks about how to actually do it that is even possible it's still kind of a hush hush for some reason when it takes two to tango so when we first began this journey and the friends and family that we had told that we were, you know, trying to conceive. For some reason, I was getting a lot of questions of, have you gotten your husband checked? Have you checked his, you know, sperm? It could be his fault, you know, whatever percentage of the time, it's the man's fault. And those were your exact words that were used at the time. And what is really mind boggling to me is, I know we as women in society, we kind of blame ourselves and accept blame first. It's kind of like a natural instinct for us, unfortunately, but I don't think that the solution to that is to blame the other person. If you're a couple that experiences infertility, you both go through a bunch of emotions. It's not singular to one person. This is a we journey. We are in this together. You know, We're both feeling different emotions that come with infertility, and I just think it's very unhealthy and very negative to even think for a second to blame one person out of the two because like i said it takes two to tango and i would be heartbroken if even for a second my husband blamed me for not being able to conceive and same goes for him i would never even think of doing that because it's hurtful there's so many challenges that come with this as it is and you have to remain a unified front you have to remain a team otherwise it can get so much more difficult Anyway, for me personally, it was kind of a no-brainer to actually get him tested first. Getting semen analysis is the simplest, quickest, most affordable test to do. You know, for women, it's a bit more complicated when it comes to hormones. You know, it's not just about us getting pregnant. It's about being able to carry the baby to term and have a healthy delivery. And it's just so much more complex. But for males, it's just a simple, you give a sample, they give you all the results you pretty much need. So before we did an actual semen analysis at a lab, we found like an at-home semen analysis at the pharmacy. It was kind of by accident and we weren't even really looking for it. And let's just say, huge waste of time. Waste of time, waste of money. I mean, it was only like 40 or 50 bucks, but completely irrelevant to any actual data. This was a while ago, but if I remember correctly, you have a sample that you put into some kind of container, you know, wait 30 minutes or something like that. And then once you like pop it open, there's an indicator that's a specific color. Now, if it was dark purple, that means everything was fine. Anything lighter, it means something is off. But here's the kicker. If you wait too long to read the results, which was only like a minute after, it would become dark regardless and that can give you a false reading. It gives you absolutely no information. And then it becomes a little bit of a debate as to what color do we really see? What is actually wrong with the sperm, if anything, because it doesn't give you any kind of breakdown of the morphology or the motility or anything like that. So do the professional route. I don't know why we did that. I guess we thought it would be easier, but it's a waste. From everything that I found out about how to improve sperm quality, what can cause you know bad quality, um, it's so individual. It is so individual to the man, to his lifestyle, to his health history. Uh, I don't like to blanket terms, so anything that I speak about in this video is specifically what helped my husband, like what I was able to find because I love going down rabbit holes when it comes to research. Everything that I found was pertaining to his specific kind of story. So just a little bit of background on my husband. He is very athletic. He has been athletic his whole entire life. 
he surprises me still with the things that he's able to do athletically, uh, mentally. It's He's really on another level. But he's been very health conscious, like he's never been a big drinker, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't do drugs. He's pretty much the epitome of health, especially compared to the general population. That's why I was so surprised when we didn't get the, the best of the best results back. But just another fact that's specific to him, he has always had high bilirubin levels. So bilirubin is directly connected to your liver. So when he was about five or six years old, he was really sick and it had affected his liver very, very tremendously. And because of that, I don't know if there was some sort of permanent liver damage, but for as long as I've known him, they were always elevated in some way. And because he had chronically high bilirubin, there was actually a study that I read, an actual study, not even just an article, of high bilirubin affecting sperm quality. And when I read that is when I kind of started to get worried because high bilirubin was something he always had and I thought, are we gonna be able to fix this? But thankfully we were. He's never really had any other symptoms of any issues with his liver except the bilirubin, so I never really thought anything of it. And also, I don't know if this is a male thing, but his body temperature runs really hot. He sweats really easily. We can be doing the same yoga class and he'll be drenched in sweat and I'm just barely breaking a sweat. But he naturally has a very high body temperature. Okay, so the first thing that we did was do like a general blood work panel back in October of 2022. So we were visiting New York at that time and my husband that weekend competed in a very, very intense high rocks competition. So that's very high interval training. It was his first competition like that. And he's a very intense person when it comes to competitions. Like he's there to win. He's there to, to really go for it. So he gave it his all. And then about a day or two later is when we got the blood draw for the blood work. So like I mentioned, he's always had high bilirubin to some extent, but this time his bilirubin was almost three times as much as it was supposed to be. So that was incredibly high. I believe he had another marker, was it ACH possibly? He had another marker that was also very, very elevated and the research I did, it was connected to his liver. So his testosterone was still good. It was just 100 or 200 points less than it normally was. So what I got from that personally was because he did such intense workout, like a competition style where you have adrenaline on top of everything, I think his liver went into overdrive. I mean, his bilirubin level and his ACH level on paper put him into some sort of liver failure. I mean, it was it was pretty bad. But I definitely think that that high intensity, it really just completely put that body into overdrive and it was overall not good for him. So that was October and we did the semen analysis at the end of January. So it takes sperm 64 days to regenerate. So what he was doing 64 days prior essentially would have had the effect on his sperm. Now, 64 days prior was about two months before that. So let's say the beginning of December. Uh, December was the one year anniversary of his mother's passing and she was 60 when she passed away and he did a 60K in her honor. 60K is about 37, point something miles and he did that just because he wanted to and that obviously puts an incredible strain on your body he ran outside there was a lot of exhaustion heat exhaustion he wasn't eating that morning except for you know honeys and fruits and whatever we were able to pass to him while he was passing me but that put his body into stress again also December was the holidays. So not that we're big drinkers to begin with, but you know, he had a few more beers than he usually would in during that month. And he was a bit more stressed than usual as well. So those are just a few things that he was doing before the analysis. Now in January, he had already stopped drinking completely. We kind of made a pact that we weren't going to drink any alcohol this year. So he did not have alcohol in January, but I'm sure whatever, December was definitely had an effect on his his results. So end of January We finally do the actual semen analysis with the lab the way that needs to be done and It's one of those moments Unfortunately that you really remember I remember exactly what I was feeling what I was doing But I got an email with the results and they were not great when I saw these results my mind spiraled in my mind, if the sperm can't actually reach the egg, then there's going to be no chance for me to get pregnant naturally. You know, if 
the sperm cannot physically get there or penetrate the egg or whatever needs to happen in order for an egg to be fertilized. How can it do that if sperm can't reach it? So let me just share what the normal numbers are supposed to be and what his analysis said in January. Okay, so normal sperm count is over 15 million. That's a normal sperm concentration. His sperm concentration was 105. So that's pretty much where the positivity ends. He had a, a good sperm concentration, like that's actually really good. Like he had a good amount. He didn't have, he wasn't lacking in the amount, but everything else was unfortunately lacking. So normal morphology needs to be at least 4%, like that's considered normal. And the percent of motility should be at least 40% and his was at 30. So not the best news, but those were the results. That was what we had to deal with. Uh, thankfully, I have a friend that is in the fertility space. And when I called her, explained that changing men's sperm is actually much simpler than anything to do with you know women's hormones because, because of that 64 day regeneration for sperm, it's actually possible and much easier to, to fix that quote unquote than it is for you know issues that I might be having. Now we technically could have done a retest around April because of the time that had passed, but I really, really wanted to give a chance for like solid results. I wanted to see clear cut results and I wanted to give it time for all the things that we implemented to work. So about six months passed and I realized that it was time to, to redo the analysis and really figure out if what he's been doing has been working or if we need to kind of uh, recuperate and figure something else out. So he did another test in the beginning of August and the results were good. I was analyzing every little piece of data instead of just going to the bottom and looking at the conclusion that it was a normal sperm analysis, but that's just the way I operate. So his sperm concentration, what already wasn't kind of an issue, doubled. It became 200 million, which is amazing. His morphology went up to 4% where it needs to be. Now let's also keep in mind that morphology percentage went up and his sperm concentration went up as well. So if you do the math on that, it significantly went up. And the motility percent went from 30 to 50%, which is a huge, huge jump. So clearly, whatever research I did to figure out this issue worked. Now, I love going down rabbit holes. I love figuring things out, puzzles. I love reading and learning. There's a problem, I wanna fix it. So based on my husband as an individual, like I said, you gotta look at the person individually in order to be able to fix what needs to be fixed. My husband runs very hot. So my tip number one, what we did, the first thing was to make sure to keep his little guys cool. Excessive heat can kill off sperm, it can kill DNA. That's a very sensitive area that can overheat really easily. So what are some tips to be able to keep those guys cool? So he was doing extreme exercise, very intense, very hot, very sweaty, like it would be a lot for his body to, to be able to process. So he significantly cut down the intensity of his workouts. By no means did he stop working out. That's not a recommended approach, but he did decrease the intensity, the duration, the, the heat that his body would produce. He also loved going into saunas after those intense workouts and saunas are very beneficial, but in this situation, we needed to keep his body as cool as possible, as often as possible. So he completely eliminated saunas he reduced his, his workout load. And most importantly, I think he changed all of his underwear to 100% cotton. When we were in the process of getting rid of all his old underwear, which is like the Calvin Klein boxer briefs that were all kind of that synthetic material, the, I guess it's polyester. If you go through a man's underwear aisle, you have all of these marketing terms on these you know, underwear packages cool wicking, air wicking, or, you know, breathability or sweat proof or all of, all of the, the terms that kind of grab your attention. You turn to the back, all of those, you know, fancy marketing terms are all synthetic materials. Synthetic materials are not breathable. I don't care what you say, your body does not breathe when you have synthetic chemicals on there. I'm not even referring to all of the stuff that is in synthetic fibers. So don't fall for those you know, fancy packages that say they're gonna keep your guys cool. You have to have the cotton underwear. Cotton is the only breathable material that actually works. 
Number two, and this was very important, my husband stopped drinking completely. His last drink, I think, was New Year's Eve of 22. So January 1st of this year, no alcohol, not a sip, absolutely zero. Alcohol obviously affects your liver, and his liver specifically, you know, cannot be put into extreme stress. Sometimes doctors have joked with him, like, based on his bilirubin levels, like, you need to stop, be, be, you know, drinking so much as if he had, like, a liver of an alcoholic. I promise you he never was, but at the end of the day, it is a poison. It's not, it does not do anything beneficial to your body. It does not help in any way. You are a social drinker, have fun with it. But we weren't drinking much to begin with, so that elimination wasn't really a big deal for us, thankfully. Number three, this one seems almost obvious, but somehow we still managed to improve this as well because like I said, he's very health conscious, but diet and nutrition play such a key role. So he was already eating super healthy, but we just kind of took it to the next level and significantly lowered our sugar intake. You know, he made sure to drink more water if he's working all day, like 12 hour days, he sometimes forgets to drink water and then he just kind of pounds a liter or two at night. That also was not good. He started drinking much, much more throughout the day, which helped clear out his system. I think that was a significant change. And when it comes to what he was eating, he increased his meat intake, increased his organs. The, you know, I started making liver more often and reduced carbs as well. Okay, and number four, supplementation is really important. When it comes to what supplements are right for you, definitely take some experimentation, definitely takes a lot of research. What I found, the number one supplement that said, you know, it, it increases sperm quality significantly was L-carnitine. So there was a lot of studies on L-carnitine improving sperm quality. However, when my husband first started taking it, he would take the full dosage on whatever the bottle said. And after about a week or so, we noticed changes in his body that kind of reflect something is going on with the liver. This is just from past experience. So he actually personally had to decrease his dosage in order to not have the liver go into overdrive. More is not always better. And when you're introducing supplements, it's really important to do it slowly so that you know what's affecting what and you can kind of gauge as to what exactly is helping and what's not. Another supplement that we incorporated for him was NAC. So NAC is a precursor to glutathione, which is great for your cells, great for sperm quality, great for all of that cellular function. And last but not least, we always needed a liver support for him because of his liver issues and that having a direct effect on his sperm quality. So we made sure to include Liver Love from Earthly, and I'll put a link down below if you're interested in that. I actually recently started taking that myself just because your liver is your t ducts organ and it's so important for overall health. Just make sure to do your own extensive research and figure out what it is you really need. So those are the top tips that I have for improving sperm quality. I absolutely love that we now have cold hard data on what worked. We had a problem back in January, we had the actual facts, figured out a way to improve it, and now we have actual data that says that it improved. So of course he's going to continue doing what he's doing because it's obviously working. When I got the results the second time, I needed that win so badly. I needed it, I got it, I'm so thankful for it. It really makes me more confident in being able to figure out kind of my own hormones and figuring out how to improve that because I was able to figure that puzzle out for him. And, and I truly appreciate that he trusted me with all the research. He pretty much did everything I asked of him. Like he, that trust and that support, I think is everything in this journey. You know, every individual is so unique. You know, everyone has their own health pieces of the puzzle that you want to put together as a whole. These are things that worked for him and I'm so happy that they did. And if you have any questions about sperm quality, anything else that we might have done, please do not hesitate to reach out. I would love to answer any questions. I am not a medical professional, but I do have experience in this clearly and I would love to help anyone that needs it. So now I am focused on myself. Now that we got that situated, I can really dive deeper into my hormones and figure things out. Um, I'm kind of in the thick of it right now. I just did some recent testing and hopefully I can kind of concise that into something comprehensible uh, very soon. If you found this video useful, please give it a thumbs up and I will see you in the next one.